My name is Elliot Lem. I attended American University for four years, and three months before I graduated, I was offered a full scholarship to graduate school at the University of Iowa, a Tarnovsky scholarship in history, all expenses paid, plus six months of overseas study. Two weeks before graduation, I went out drinking in D.C. to celebrate my impending trip. A little after two in the morning, I decided to walk back to the apartment I shared with some friends instead of taking a cab. I got lost, cutting through an unfamiliar side street, and went down a long alley to retrace my steps. There was a woman standing in the alley under a lamplight. She appeared normal, and I thought nothing of her as I passed, but she stopped me with a question. She asked me if I could show her how to hold her breath under water. I asked her what she meant, and saw then that her expression was dazed, unfocused, and despite her tasteful manner of dress, she seemed dirty. Her blouse was stained with a black substance. As I stood there for that one moment, she brought her right hand out from behind her back. In it, she held a sword, a real metal sword. Her eyes widened, and without another word, she swung it forcefully at my leg. I screamed and tried to ward off the blow, but I couldn't. I crumpled to the cement, the sword embedded just above my knee, as she simply walked away down the alley. My screams brought help to me quickly, but not soon enough. The pain after my leg was treated, after my three days in the hospital, was far worse than I thought it would be. My leg had to be totally immobilized, and then I was in crutches for two months, and during this time I slowly developed a dependence on the drug z -Sambanol. I thought it was fine, but when I went off it, I couldn't deal with it. It felt like my body was screaming for it. It made me lose interest in preparing for school, and I had a lot of insomnia. It took months for the leg to heal. I decided to postpone going to Iowa for a semester and start instead in January. I didn't want anyone to know about this dependence I was struggling with, so rather than go back to my father's house in Pennsylvania, I rented an efficiency in a building where my landlord was a 94-year-old woman. All this time, my prescription for the z sominol just kept going and going, even though my leg was totally functional again. But the feeling of being without the drug was intolerable. I worked at a call center for a little while, but I almost got fired because I missed work too much. My depression was getting pretty bad, and I was drinking, drinking a lot. Alone, mostly, sometimes with some college friends who were still at American. It was the only thing that killed the feeling of being without z -Sominol. One day I saw an ad in the paper in the Help Wanted section, which said, Cleaning assistant needed. Fourteen dollars an hour night shifts, so I applied for it. And it turned out that what I would be helping to clean was crime scenes. Crime scenes in places where there was some biological hazard. The company consisted of just one person. His name was Peter. He was about 65 years old, I think, but he dyed his hair a totally artificial black. It looked awful. And he was incredibly skinny, and his arms were covered in tattoos. He'd been in the Navy, then he was a barber for years and years, then a sports handicapper in Reno. And finally, through his brother, he got into cleaning crime scenes, just going around in a van when he got a call and doing this. He swore all the time, he smoked all the time. Just the most awful person. But he gave me the job, and I needed it. He gave me a beeper, and I was on call basically 24 hours a day. The job was repulsive. We would show up after the police had left a motel room or someone's house, after all the evidence had been taken away. And we cleaned up blood, we cleaned up after someone had committed suicide, or someone had been killed. The people were always gone by then, but it was unthinkable. A lot of the time, the whole thing was just going to a scene where someone had been shot even in an alley or on the street, and just power-washing a small amount of blood away, or covering the spot with chemicals. Our nights always ended with us taking the remains of what we had to throw out and driving them into the middle of nowhere to an EPA dumpster. 
The second job I went on with Peter, I had to put on a protection mask and gloves, the whole thing. Peter had been told we wouldn't need that stuff for this one, but we got inside the door of this house, and we saw something red sprayed on the walls. And he swore under his breath and told me we'd have to get our gear on. When I saw that red substance on the walls and staining a lampshade in there, I almost walked away right then. It wasn't blood, though, that we'd seen. The man in the house had committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. He'd run a gas generator inside his house as he slept to kill himself. But before he'd done this, he had, for some reason, gone through his refrigerator and thrown all the food all over the first floor of the house. Two jars of spaghetti sauce had been hurled against one wall. he dumped orange juice everywhere and actually opened up all his cans of soup and thrown them against the walls, too. Peter was always trying to get me to come out with him after work or before work. He had no friends that I knew of. I was always trying to avoid him, but to be nice one night, I went over to his house to watch a football game. We were sitting there, and right behind my head, in the wall, I heard a scratching sound, like just one finger scratching. It scratched for ten seconds, then it stopped, then it started again, it went on for five or seven seconds. And Peter obviously heard it too, but all he did was immediately turn the TV volume up. The scratching stopped for about ten minutes, and then it started again. And I said, what's going on with this? What do you think that is? And Peter just kept watching the TV, and he said, Yeah, don't worry about that. That's just my little friend. Just ignore it. But I couldn't ignore it. It was right behind my head. It didn't make any sense, because there was no adjacent room. So I told him he probably had a raccoon in the wall or something, but Peter said no, that wasn't it. It had been going on for six months off and on, but it wasn't a raccoon. I asked him how he knew, and still watching the TV, without the slightest interest in the scratching, he said, just watch this. And he came across the room and he sat on the sofa and tilted his head way back so it touched the wall. And after ten seconds, the scratching had moved suddenly to a spot right behind his head. He got up after that and went back across to his easy chair, and he said, Just don't let your head touch the wall, and you won't be bothered anymore. I waited until Peter went to the bathroom, and I put my head back against the wall, and almost right away the finger scratching began again. I got up and moved three feet over to the sofa and tilted my head back again so that it touched the wall. And the scratching started right there, too, right behind my head. Peter came back right at that second, and he was incredibly mad. He yelled at me not to get it started, because if it really got started, it could go on all night. So we watched the game, and a call came in ten minutes before it finished, and we had to go out. The call this time was to a building in Rockville. It was on a small, scientific campus owned by some private research company. We were waved through a gate and up a small road to the front of a plain brick building. We saw that a window had been broken, more like blown out, on the third floor of the building. A cop took us in after telling us it would just be a blood job. He told us as we went in that there was a lot of animal research and vivisection in this building and that a German shepherd had gotten loose during a surgical procedure, and had gotten way out of control and had jumped to its death out the third-story window. When we got up there, there was just one employee of the company left in the building. It was about eleven o'clock. He pointed to a dark trail of blood that began inside what looked like a very small operating room. The blood went into the hallway, turned a corner, and then went in more or less a straight line down another hallway about fifty feet long, right into the shattered window. They'd had to cut the dog out of a short tree outside the building. In the extremity of its madness, it had crashed through the window and fallen downwards into it, getting caught up in the branches and hanging from them. There was much more blood on the sidewalk now. We never asked what they'd been doing to that dog or why it had gone insane. We cleaned the place up like we were told to. 
I thought about the scratching in Peter's house a lot over the next couple of weeks. Peter started to talk about it more and more whenever we drove somewhere. He said sometimes he couldn't sleep because he could just barely hear it from his bedroom. One night as we were sitting in the van waiting for the police to come and open up an apartment, he said to me, out of nowhere, without smiling at all, Oh, I bet it's that guy who drowned on our ship that time. I bet he still thinks it's my fault he went under. Well, maybe it was, you know. I still feel kind of bad about that. Somewhere in there I was in some bar pretty drunk, and someone next to me asked me to please stop what I was doing, and I said, what am I doing? I had been scratching the top of the bar with my finger, unconsciously, again and again. For a month or so I did the job, and then there was a stretch of two days when Peter didn't call me. And I decided that whenever he did I would tell him I'd had enough, I, I would quit. On the third night a call came to my beeper. It wasn't Peter, it was the Holiday Inn in Chantilly, and the manager and someone on the police had been trying to reach Peter. But there was no answer, and they needed a room cleaned. I drove over to his place the next morning because I couldn't reach him either. His van was there, parked in the driveway. I knocked, but no one came. I went around to the back porch, and I saw that the door was open back there, wide open. I stuck my head in and called out, but there wasn't any answer. I went through the kitchen and into the living room. The wall opposite the front window had been ripped apart. The wall where that scratching was. It had been completely ripped open with long, diagonal, and horizontal slashes that went all over the place, gouging the paint in the drywall, creating a lot of little holes. There were about twenty of them. And there was a chainsaw sitting in the middle of the floor, which was covered in dust because of all the little bits of wall that had flown out. The wall had been completely, crazily attacked. But there was no sign of Peter. I never went upstairs, though. He might have been up there, but that back door being open made me think he was gone. Almost as soon as I saw the chainsaw, I backed out of there and left. And I never found out what happened to him. Maybe three nights after that, I got totally drunk at the bar closest to my place. I got so drunk this time that it didn't even occur to me not to drive. I just lost the ability to think. I remember driving all over my neighborhood. I was trying to find my way home, but I was senseless. I drove along the shoulder for a mile or more at a walking pace, just crawling along. And then through the windshield I saw black gates in front of me, tall iron gates in the dark, and it had become foggy. For some reason I thought I had to go through the gates to get home, so I nudged the front of the car forward into them, and they parted in front of me. There was a gravel path then that I could just barely see through the fog, so I moved the car forward. I was so drunk it took all my effort just to stay on the path. To my right, I saw tombstones going past me. The headlights picked them up, marching past in long rows. The side of the car scraped a tree. Suddenly the path went one way or the other, and I lost it. I didn't turn at all and the nose of the car went downward, and it slid about ten feet down a tiny hill and then leveled out. I hit the brakes hard, so the car went sideways and skidded in the grass, which was wet, and then it stalled. I shut off the lights and killed the engine, and I got out. I saw some tiny lights way off in the distance, so I started walking in that direction, just totally staggering. Then I was in the main part of the cemetery, and it was completely dark. And the fog had settled about three feet off the ground. It came up to my waist. I could see all these silhouettes of tombstones marching away toward the woods. And then I saw a shape, about one hundred feet away, a shape coming toward me. It was something like a man. I could just make it out. It was completely black. It seemed like the shape was being carried along the ground somehow. It was moving so smoothly. 
I froze because the image was so like when I saw as a child in a picture book showing the flying Dutchman, a shadow with yellow eyes floating along the water beside a clipper ship, reaching its arms out on the night sea. Suddenly a bright light came on and I screamed. The man's shape was the caretaker of the cemetery, holding a flashlight and coming to see if I was hurt. And I don't remember anything after that light went off in my eyes until I was in a jail cell. I stayed the night in the tiny cell until they let me go the next day. The other person in the cell introduced himself to me. His name was Maurice. He had long black hair, really long, and he was as thin as Peter had been. He had a strange tattoo on his arm, half a skeleton, just half, divided vertically. He was in jail for defacing some fountain. He didn't go into it too much. We talked about music and a little about the Civil War history of the area. At seven the next morning I was let go, and Maurice shook my hand and he invited me to a party the very next night. I wound up going, I guess because I was lonely. I lost touch with my friends. I didn't want them to see me while I was getting off z Sominal. So I went to this slummy little house at the end of a cul-de-sac in a bad neighborhood. It was a group house. There were about six or seven people living there. And it wasn't really a party at all. There were only four or five people who didn't already live there. It wasn't anything more than them just sitting around and getting high. There were shelves full of movies I'd never heard of before, and a third shelf was filled with tapes marked either trances or group mass. At about midnight, Maurice told me to come upstairs with him. I remember that as we went, I asked him what he did for a living, and he said he had a hand in some club in the city. It occurred to me that whenever he was asked anything about the specifics of his life, he was evasive. And now that I had seen him more, I thought he must have lied when he said he was 25. He looked at least five years older than that. We went into his room at the end of the hall. All that was in there was a mattress and a writing desk and a chair, nothing else, except for a bureau where his clothes were. He opened up a drawer in the bureau, and he held out a dagger, the blade curving sharply to a strange angle. He said it was for nothing in particular. He used to just mess around with it. It was designed for marking the skin without cutting it. And I looked at Maurice, and I asked him if he was a Satanist or something. And he said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. We all are, us living here. The six of us are. He said I had to understand it wasn't about hurting anyone or hurting himself. All it was was getting on a path to recognizing and accepting the darkest aspects of living in this world, welcoming them into your life, and seeing those aspects as a natural part of existence, seeing death and all the horrors that could come for you as inevitable and understandable so that when something awful happened to you, you were prepared for it. It meant the chance to meet the things in the dark, embrace them, and lose their fear of them so they could get on living. I asked him how he went about doing that, and he told me they were having a gathering on Friday, and he invited me to come to it just the one time. I don't know how I answered, but I wound up leaving the house that night and actually walking home instead of driving. I left my car there and staggered back to my room. But I did go back. I talked to Maurice on the phone, and he asked me again to come. Just come and pick up my car and stop in at the gathering for half an hour. Because he thought I was ready to see his side of things. And I think it was loneliness again that sent me back there, but I was also a little curious... Maurice didn't seem insane, so I looked at it as a chance to peek into a corner I had never seen before. So on Friday night, I walked back to Maurice's house, where he lived with those six other people. When I got there at ten, there were five or six more people inside. We talked for about twenty minutes about nothing in particular, and everyone seemed to not want to mention the specifics of why we were there. Then Maurice said, Okay, let's all go down into the basement. 
down in the basement, it was completely empty. There was nothing there except for a cement floor, a water heater, and a light bulb on a chain. Just a big open area. Everyone went down the stairs, and we stood there, and they were all waiting for Maurice to tell them what to do. Obviously, he was the leader of the group. He told us all to lay down in a big circle, lay down and stare at the ceiling. So we all did it. We all fanned out in a ring and stared up at the ceiling, lying on the cold cement floor. He stood in the center of it. He told us to close our eyes, so we did, and then he shut off the light. You could hear it and sense it. He had us lie there for a couple of minutes, completely quiet, just breathing. Then he said, I want you all to imagine yourself in the woods, alone in the woods, late at night. It's winter, just like it is now. And in the trees in front of you, there are white sheets hanging from the branches every fifty feet or so, torn into ribbons. And these fragments of sheets are all more or less in a line, just waving in the wind. You're going to follow them. So imagine yourself in those woods, walking forward between them, stepping on leaves and twigs and branches, and as you pass by the torn sheets, the wind ruffles them, and they touch you as you go by. You walk and walk, and eventually there's a break in the woods, and you step out into a clearing. The clearing ends at a long hill that slopes upwards for two hundred feet. You're looking up, and at the top of that hill there's a palace standing there against the sky. A glorious palace, with jewels embedded in the stones over the entrance, and more windows than you can count and the palace is made of ancient brick. There must be two hundred rooms in the palace, and it's lit up with a thousand candles along the roof. Maurice told us to imagine ourselves walking up toward that palace, up the grassy hill, and crossing a drawbridge over a moat, and entering through the tall doors. But once you get inside, he said, something strange, because it's not very welcoming at all. You are expecting people, revelers, but there's no one there. It's dark and kind of dusty, and there's not much of anything in the grand foyer. You go up a stone flight of steps, and on the second floor it's even darker, and there are cobwebs everywhere. You see that there's one flight of stairs leading to the top level. And then Maurice said to us, Do you want to go up those stairs? And when he asked that, the people in the room, all of them except for me, said, Yes, simultaneously. It was kind of a shock the way they did that. So Marie said, All right. You climb that last flight of steps, and you see that there's blood on the steps, and something smells foul when you reach the top. And at the top of the palace it's almost totally dark. You can barely see your hand in front of your face. Do you want to keep walking forward? And everyone in the room again said, Yes, in perfect unison except me. So Maurice went on. He said, All around you in this hallway there are hands on the floor, severed hands. As you walk forward you can hear screams from behind the walls. Finally you bump into something in the dark. It's a wooden door. You can turn back now and run away, but do you want to open it? And everyone said, Yes! with no doubt or any hesitation. Maurice said, You open the door and you enter a tiny room. It's very hot in the room, and around you are the whispers of people begging for your help. And they're also telling you that you shouldn't be here. It's too dangerous. Fingers reach out to touch you, and though you can't see anything, you can feel the blood on their hands touching your cheek. And some of them are screaming, and you can barely breathe. And this is the very last chance to turn back and leave the palace because all that waits for you now is a trap door in the center of the room. If you open that door and go down through it, you will know all the secrets of the palace. Do you want to open that trap door? Do you want to know its secrets? And one last time, everyone in the basement said, Yes! But louder this time, almost shouting it all together. Then, like a circuit breaker had snapped inside my mind, I went unconscious. That's the last thing I knew of. When I woke up, it was morning, and I was lying on the sofa in the main room downstairs. I was face up, still in my clothes, and it was just past dawn. And I wondered what had happened to me. 
I hadn't drunk enough to pass out or black out. Everything had just gone out at some point. I sat up and I felt really groggy, like I had a fever, and I just walked over to the front door and I walked out. And I got in my car and I drove home. On the way driving, I saw something strange about my wrists. The inside of my right wrist had a small abrasion on it, a horizontal one. It ran about halfway across, almost as if I had been burned. And on my left wrist, in the same place, a half inch below the beginning of my palm, was the smallest hint of the same thing, maybe a centimeter across, but definitely an abrasion. My first thought was that something had at some point been tied around my wrists. I went home and I slept until almost four in the afternoon. Maurice called me that night around eleven, and he asked me what I thought of the little gathering. He said they'd found me passed out when they'd turned the lights on again about an hour after they started, and they were a little worried. They didn't know why I'd blacked out. I didn't mention the marks on my wrists, but I did ask him what happened that last half hour or so, what they had all done there in the dark. And he said it had just been some kind of meditation and visualization ritual that they had all gone through before. They wanted to invite me the next night to something called a proxy crawl. I asked him what that was, and he said he couldn't really explain it to me, but it was something the group did every few months, a little bit more intensely each time, and anyone new should really experience it for themselves. I had no interest in going back there. The thought of it disturbed me. But my depression was doing something to me. It was slowly making it seem like anything that happened to me was all right as long as I didn't have a say in it. Then, as if knowing what I really needed, Maurice said he could get me more Zisaminol. He wanted to pick me up at nine the next night. My fever came back when I went to bed around midnight. It got later and later, and at one point, for no reason I could really understand, I got scared of the dark in the room, and everything outside of it. Part of this paranoia was brought on by the fever, but not all of it. The room was too still and too quiet, so I decided to break it, to say something out loud. I couldn't think of what, so, out of nowhere, not really knowing why I chose these words, I said, Satan, show yourself, very loudly. I think hoping that saying something completely absurd would end it would get me out of the trance I was in. I tensed up, and I felt like I suddenly couldn't move at all. My arms and my legs felt locked. I couldn't even move my head from side to side. And in the corner of the room, at about knee height, a small black mass evolved from nothing. Then the mass was hanging in the air, and then it was coming toward me, very slowly through the dark. I wanted to jump up and run, but I couldn't move. I was petrified, both with fear and with some kind of physical failure which rendered my limbs useless. I was lying on my left side, and I couldn't move. This black mass of gauze came forward and floated toward my face, getting bigger and bigger, just a solid field of total darkness about a foot on each side. I was sweating, my heart was pounding. It got to within six inches of my face, then to about three inches, completely obliterating my view of anything but itself. And it stopped and I was left looking into this entirely featureless patch of the darkest night, something so absolute and awful I was afraid to close my eyes before it. And then it withdrew, just as slowly as it had come for me. It went back toward the corner of the room. It took maybe two minutes to fade, and then it just devolved into nothing again. It took me a full hour just to calm down, and at some point I fell asleep. I had a couple of job interviews the next day. It was a good thing, the interviews, doing something normal. 
At about dusk, though, I got very low. I had three beers, I turned the TV on full blast, and turned all the lights on, and I watched sitcoms. Maurice was supposed to pick me up at about nine, but nine came and went, and then ten, then eleven, and still no sign of him. Finally, at eleven-thirty, Maurice pulled up outside and honked his horn, and I went out and got into his car. He was different. Everything about him seemed different. There was no real friendliness in him suddenly. We were driving, and I finally asked him if anyone but him had touched me the other night when I passed out. He said no. And I showed him my wrists. I pointed out the abrasions. He just looked at them for a second and went back to staring through the windshield. As we were going down this country road with the high beams on, he shook out five z pills from a Ziploc bag and gave them to me. He began speaking about how Satanism had changed him over the past three years since he had gotten into it, how it was getting easier and easier for him to keep one foot in the normal world, keep up a mask for his friends and his parents and the people he saw at his job, and at the same time be somewhere else entirely, all day and all night, even when he was asleep. We drove for fifteen more minutes, deeper and deeper into the country, and at one point there were woods on either side of us, and I recognized where we were. We were on a one-lane, unmarked blacktop in a state park I had been to before, and Maurice pulled over just after it on a wide patch of dirt, and he stopped the car, and he smiled for the first time that night. He said this is where we were meeting everyone. I got out. It was really cold, and I looked around, and I followed Maurice onto a trail, and we started walking deeper into the woods. Our night vision got adjusted very quickly. There were absolutely no artificial lights, house lights, neighborhood lights on for miles. We walked for about five minutes, and the woods got a little thicker, and someone was up ahead. It was a guy named Curtis, who I'd met at Maurice's house. He nodded at me, and then a girl named Paula was there. And we kept walking. And then I saw something unusual about the trees up ahead. There were strips of white sheets hanging from the branches. Then more and more of them, pretty much marking our way through the woods. Just bed sheets, torn up, hanging there, fluttering in the wind. No one was saying anything. Maurice was right beside me. He just stared at the ground as we walked. After a minute, I realized that the others were walking about as fast as I was, but they were lagging behind me. I was actually in front now. Even Maurice had dropped a couple of steps back. When I stopped to let him catch up, he stopped too, and he said, No, no, you're going first. This is your crawl. And that's when I got really scared. The others had stopped and they were looking at me. And I asked them where we were going, and Maurice said that we were going to the palace, just like the other night. Only tonight, I was going to take them there. It had to be me. I said, why me? And he didn't say anything for a second. Then he just said, if you walk ahead just a couple of more minutes, the palace will be waiting. I didn't know what else to do. There was only one trail. The woods were thick. There was only one way to go. So I went forward, and I was thinking about how to get away from these people. I thought it was very possible that they were going to try to hurt me. In another 30 seconds or so, I saw that the trail was ending up ahead. I could see grass there. The woods were ending. I heard Maurice say, Stop! And I turned around, and they had all stopped, but he told me they would just wait for me to step into the clearing and see the palace. I got to see it first tonight, and I would lead them in, and they would join me there. It was just a few steps more, he said, and when I saw it, I would know how great it was to behold it. So I walked ahead, and the trees ended, and then I was in a clearing. There was a gently sloping hill in front of me. It rose up to its highest point about a hundred yards away. And I looked up toward the top of the hill. 
and there was a house, totally darkened, and it was almost nothing more than wreckage. It had been burned, destroyed, probably years before. The windows had been boarded up, and even in the dark from a hundred yards away I could see holes in the side of it. The porch had been ripped apart. The front door was missing entirely, and the one window that was left on the front was broken. It was a condemned house sitting in the clearing at the top of the hill. And I knew right then, without a doubt, that something terrible was going to happen to me if I went up that hill. And I began to run. I ran towards the right as fast as I could up the hill, over the field, going past the house on the diagonal, and over the top of the hill the field sloped down again, and in the distance I saw a radio tower, beyond more woods. It was a two hundred yard run just to get to the woods, and I was breathing hard. I turned my head to look for a split second, and they were all following me. They were running too, and I was way ahead of them, but I could see all of them were coming. And if I fell down, I thought I would die. So I never looked back, and I left the field and I broke into the woods. It felt like I was having a heart attack, that cold air rushing into my lungs, and there was no trail. So I was running through the trees, and all of a sudden the trees broke again, and I was suddenly coming out between two houses in a neighborhood somewhere. I ran through a backyard and came out in a cul-de-sac, and I fell right there on the pavement. I couldn't run any longer. I didn't care what happened. I lay there for ten minutes, never looking back. Finally I got up, and I had no idea where I was. I walked down the street, taking every turn that came along, too shaken to establish any sense of direction. All I wanted was to stumble across a main road. I did, and there was a 7-Eleven right on it, facing the entrance to the community. There I called a cab, and I waited inside the store until it came. I didn't take it back to my room, though. I went to the Holiday Inn a mile away from it. I checked in, and I went upstairs and fell asleep right away. I opened the curtains all the way before I did, so I would wake up with lots of light falling on me. I didn't hear anything from anyone for the next three days, which I just spent existing, doing small things. I was sitting in a coffee house reading the newspaper when I came across a little blurb in the local section. It said a man named Maurice Aikens, 33 years old, from Potomac, Maryland, was killed in a car accident the night before. A single car accident. He'd hit a deer and run off the road in Manassas. Maurice was actually dead. Two nights after being there in the woods, and it wasn't some transcendence. He hadn't sacrificed himself. He'd hit a deer, driving along at four o'clock in the morning. And that was it. What it felt like, though, was one more piece of something closing in on me. Something coming for me. One step after another. The next day, I headed out and walked until my feet hurt. I was walking and trying to keep myself away from drinking, getting further and further out, mile after mile, until I didn't know really where I was. I was deep in the suburbs, and it started to rain. I went into an anonymous-looking sports bar in a strip mall, hoping just to stay dry. There was almost no one inside, nothing on the TV set, nobody playing pool, no waitress working. There was just a guy behind the bar, so I sat there and ordered a sandwich. And when it came, I went over to a booth in a corner, and I sat there eating it. From where I was sitting, I could see the booth opposite the aisle, and there was a priest sitting there, just sitting, not eating or drinking anything. I looked over at him from time to time, and he finally looked at me, and he shrugged, and he said, I've been stood up, looks like. And I said something pointless, like, that's too bad, and then he got up, and he came over to my booth, and he just sat across from me, just like that. He introduced himself as Father Hall. He said he was expecting a friend, but 
The friend was an hour and a half late. He said he thought I looked ill, and I told him that I had some kind of a fever, and I was very tired from walking. I remember now he never shook my hand, which was actually a relief to me. He said he wished he could give me a ride, but he was on foot himself, and he would have left by now, except for the rain. So we talked for a while, as I ate. He noticed that I seemed very down, and I told him it had been a rough couple of days and a rough couple of months. And somehow we got to talking about the attack, and how I hadn't gone back to my father's house, and I had no job. And I told him about working for Peter, and getting involved with some people who turned out to be bad for me. He asked me a lot of questions about myself, and he really wanted to know how my friends had turned out not to be friends. So I found myself telling him the entire story. Everything from my experience with the cleaning job, to the strange scratching sounds in Peter's house, to my meeting Maurice, to the marks on my wrists, to the way they'd taken me into the woods. We sat there for about an hour, and at some point when I was talking about how I'd found out about Maurice's death, I realized I was crying. And Father Hall didn't do the obvious thing, which was talk about God. He waited till I had regained myself, and then he asked me if I had thought about checking into a hospital. So of course I told him yes, but that I was afraid to do it, because who knew what they would discover about me when I went in. He invited me to meet him the next day. He wanted to talk about ways just to get me back on my feet again and thinking clearly, and he promised they would have nothing to do with the church. He asked me to write down an address, and I did, and I stuck it in my pocket. He said to meet him there the next day at around three if I wanted, and I said I'd try. And he got up and left. I didn't meet Father Hall the next day, though. I didn't go. I suddenly felt a little ashamed at having cried in front of him. I told myself it wasn't necessary that I'd had my catharsis. On that Friday night, I began my court sentence for my drunk driving conviction. I'd pled guilty, no lawyer, no anything. My court sentence was to work as a night watchman at a high school a few miles away. I would have to do this every night until I got a real job, every night from 10 till 5 in the morning, six days a week. There had been a lot of vandalism recently at the school, Ellington High School, some break-ins. So they figured this would be good community service. I was led into the school by a janitor, led out by a different one. I had no keys, I had no uniform, no weapon or anything. It was my job just to stay inside the school, make occasional rounds of the hallways and the classrooms, and call the police if I saw anything suspicious. It was five days after I met Father Hall that something happened. I was in the gym. It was about 1.30 in the morning. I was sitting in a chair near the big picture window that ran the length of the wall looking out on the parking lot, which was completely empty. There was only one light on back in the locker room. I was basically in the dark, except I had a flashlight, which I read by, and I heard a sound like a door closing with an echo, but very far away, which made me think at first that it came from the boiler room, which was at the basement level, which you got to by opening a door inside the locker room, going down a little hallway, and then going down a short flight of steps. So I thought I'd check out the boiler room. I'd been there once before. The janitor kept the door to the steps open at night in case something happened with the heat or something, so I could check on it. I went through the door to the locker room and down the little hallway, where the janitor had created a little office consisting of a card table and a shelf he'd screwed into the wall. I went past that and down the steps. The boiler room was a maze of pipes and machinery. I didn't even know where the light switches were, so I just navigated by flashlight giving the entire place a quick once-over. The end of the basement was about fifteen feet ahead of me when I saw the thing by the light of the flashlight. There was a chair set against the far cement wall between two tall water heaters. There was something sitting in the chair. I took a few steps closer and I stopped, looking at it with the flashlight. The thing was wrapped, swaddled, 
in a black sort of cloak all over its body, down over where the feet of a person would be. But this wasn't a human being. It was twice as big, enormous. It had recognizable arms, which were the, on the chair's arms. It was sitting up, and I saw its hands, which were three times the size of normal human hands. The fingers were gigantic and doughy, a pale white color, and there weren't enough of them. There were three or four on each hand. There weren't any fingernails, either. The hands were perfectly still. The entire body of the thing was perfectly still. The head inside the cloak was overly large, and it was almost a featureless lump. The nose was squashed flat. The mouth ran horizontally too far to each side. There was just a slit, no lips. A slit running from one side of the head to another. The thing's face was gray, a light gray. The texture of the skin made it seem like it was made up of thousands of specks of gray sand. It had huge eyes, all one color, a dark red, I think. I'd say the eyes were the size of saucers. It looked like it was gazing at the ceiling, but it didn't have any pupils. The eyes were just a mass of dark red. I kept the flashlight trained on it for more than a minute, and I could eventually detect movement. It was breathing, but it wasn't making a sound, and it wasn't looking at me. Its head was cocked back to the ceiling like it was near death, comatose. It just sat there, in the dark. It didn't seem capable of any real movement. But I backed away, just a little at a time, all the way back to the steps, and only then did I turn and go slowly back up them, into the gym. And I sat back in my chair, and I just stayed there for an hour, watching that outer door. I thought that I would sit there for as long as it took to be able to go back down there and look again. I thought the chances were good that it was all in my head, which was almost a relief. It meant I was going chemically mad, and I could be helped. I would go to the hospital the next day if I went back down there and the thing was gone. It was about an hour, and then I went back. I went through the door, down the hallway, down the steps. And from all the way across the boiler room, I shone the flashlight against the back wall. And sure enough, the chair was still there, but the thing was gone. The ceiling of the boiler room was just those tagboard squares and a big grid. I saw that the square directly above the chair was gone. I knew it had been there when I first saw the thing. I knew it. And on the chair and on the cement wall behind it were streaks of what looked like reddish mud. Like something had gone up the wall and dragged these streaks behind it. I shone the light up into the hole where the square had been. But of course I couldn't see anything. There was just a little of the mud on the chair, not much. But it was also on the thin metal bars that made up the ceiling grid. The bars just above my head where the square had disappeared. I considered standing on the chair and pointing the flashlight into the crawl space above the ceiling, but my nerve finally failed me. I left the room, and I went back up through the gym to the main entrance, and I opened one of the front doors of the school. I propped it open with a chair, and I stood outside where the buses dropped people off, and I didn't go back inside the school. At one point I thought I heard something, and I clamped my hands to my ears. Finally the morning janitor showed up. I didn't say anything about anything. I just left. If he ever saw the chair and the substance the thing had left behind, I never heard about it. I went to see Father Hall the next day. I only had the address he gave me, not a phone number. I got off the train in a deserted, industrial section of town, just block after block of warehouses and auto garages and a plastics plant. The address Father Hall had given me was for the shelter he worked at four days a week, but when I got to that address it was a bowling alley that had been torn down long ago, and next to that some food distributor. 
Something had gone wrong, obviously, so I walked a couple of blocks in each direction, and I saw Father Hall walking toward me along the sidewalk. He waved at me, then came up and asked me if I'd come to see him, and I said yes. And he said he was sorry for getting the address wrong. He was headed off to teach a class in a church somewhere, but he said he had a while to talk, so we took a walk around this industrial section of town, which bordered on a notorious slum, and I told him I'd had a rough go of it. I thought I was seeing things. This led to me explaining what I saw at the school, and I had to tell him about my problem with the painkillers and the drinking and my sentence because of it. He said he understood, listened very carefully, and he asked me to describe again the thing that I had seen in the basement. In the end, he asked me if I really wanted to go into the hospital because if I thought I could hold on for a little while longer, there was something he wanted me to try. He said my experiences with Peter and Maurice and my drinking and my despair had maybe harmed parts of my mind that I had never confronted before all of that coming so fast. But seeing the thing in the boiler room might actually have been a good sign that I could make it out of this whole situation in one piece. He said seeing that creature may have been my mind's attempt to snap me into asking harder questions of myself. By going over the line into total fantasy, it was telling me I needed to be healed desperately. Father Hall said that I should ask myself all the hard questions about my life I had been trying to avoid with drinking. But to do that, I needed to screen out the influences of all human beings, every single one of them, and make myself more alone than most anyone was willing to do. He said if I went without human contact for a while, human contact of any kind, the parts of me that had been fragmented and distorted might come back to me. I might be able to think clearly and find a path for myself that wasn't tainted by all the people who had been trying to claim me. I shouldn't work for a while, no friends, no TV, no newspapers, no speaking to strangers, no phone calls. And then if I got better or worse, I should come see him, I should come back to Father Hall and tell him about it. I told him I'd do it. I could keep up with my community service, I could keep going to the school. I didn't have to exchange so much as a word with the janitors. And I didn't have to go see my probation officer for another couple of weeks maybe even three. I just wouldn't stay inside the school during my shifts. I wouldn't do the rounds they wanted me to. I couldn't even go back into the gym. I'd prop a door open and read in the doorway close to the parking lot every night. I told Father Hall I thought I could try it. And he said, all right, please do it. And if it doesn't help, we'll get help for you. And he got up and he walked back in the direction he'd come from. And he said he'd see me later. What happened when I cut myself off from all the human contact I possibly could, killed off all the voices, was that I started to see how closely related and connected I was to all the things around me in my life. Connected to my bed, to the food I ate, to the sun, to the grass, my clothes, the clock, time moving past me. Everything around me was there to help me through life. And I saw how it was people alone who clouded things, because people could hurt me. The only hard part was the darkness in my room, because I was scared of what I'd see in the dark. I wished I wasn't alone then. The very first night of the treatment, I went to get some food, but late, really, really late, at the all-night pharmacy, so I would see as few people as possible. And I bought some sleeping pills, so I could black out immediately when I needed to sleep. During the day I went on long walks, but never anywhere where I could be seen, where I drove to the river and stayed there for hours. When I ran out of alcohol, I didn't go get more, because paying for it would have made me have to see someone, and I didn't want that. I had no money left, I was living off my credit cards, so I'd go to the library at AU for hours at a time. I'd wear a face mask in the cold so no one could see me or want to talk to me, and I would isolate myself in a corner of the library and read. That's where I read three different books about Satanism, and in a book called The Unfamiliar, I read about people who, 
for no reason misperceived sensory things, like one man who drank blood at a satanic ceremony and honestly believed it had been nothing but water. To Satanists, these errors of perception meant a door was opening up in the brain. If the door wasn't found and closed with their help, demons would come through. The demons waited until the door was so far open that the person would think nothing of seeing them on the very street where he lived, wouldn't deny their existence because the senses were telling this person that everything should be accepted. And then possession could begin. I began to have nightmares. They got longer and longer and worse and worse until by the end of ten or eleven days I was scared to go to sleep. I was afraid to take more pills because I thought I would overdose. I wasn't eating much of anything, I realized. I would have a bowl of cereal and that would be it for the day or I would eat half a sandwich in twenty-four hours. I didn't change my clothes. I didn't bathe. I didn't shave. More and more I would think about how easy it would be to just end it all instead of going back and telling all this to Father Hall, or entering the hospital. It would be so much easier to just starve and never get out of bed. But no, I forced myself out and back on the metro, and I took the train to the stop where I had met Father Hall near the shelter where he worked during the day. I went in, and right away there were rows of cots, no lobby or desk or anything, just homeless people. Even at noon there were a few because of the snow coming on. A man came walking up to me, a big red-haired guy, military kind of guy, and he asked me if he could help me. I told him I was looking for Father Hall, and he looked at me in a funny way and he said, sorry, there's no one here by that name. I said, well, this man, this priest, told me that he worked here four days a week. But the red-haired guy said he had been there almost every day for the past two years, and he had never heard of Father Hall. So I turned back to the entrance, and I stepped out and stood there for a minute, not knowing what to do. I thought I must have made some sort of stupid mistake. Then I heard the guy's voice call me back, and he came to the doorway, and he said, Just a second, could you wait here just one minute? He asked me to talk to the man who ran the place, Ned. And he led me back, between the rows of cots. I went back into a tiny office. The red-haired guy came in, too, and behind a small desk there was a man in a sweater and jeans who was about fifty, and moved with a cane. This Ned wanted me to tell him about Father Hall. He wanted to know where I'd met him, and what he looked like, and what he talked about. Ned said maybe he knew him. Maybe. A year before, there had been a homeless woman who had stayed at the shelter off and on. He'd forgotten her name. She'd been a drug addict and slightly unbalanced mentally, but she'd mentioned someone named Father Hall, too. She'd wanted Ned to tell Father Hall to stop visiting her. She said he found her every day, wherever she happened to be, and never stopped trying to start conversations with her. In the beginning, he had been very kind to her, but... Then he had tried to get her to come away with him, not to church, but to a mission he talked about somewhere way outside the city. She claimed that Father Hall had begun to insist every day that she come with him, telling her he couldn't protect her if she didn't, that she'd wind up freezing to death or being killed. So she began to fear him. But the way she had talked about him to Ned, asking him every other day to keep Father Hall away from her, they had become convinced that there really was no Father Hall, since she said he kept appearing in her room, appearing at the foot of her bed in the middle of the night. Sometimes the homeless woman claimed that Father Hall wanted her to come work in a mission, and sometimes she said he wanted her to go to a palace. She said conflicting things, and she never knew his first name. Eventually she'd drifted off somewhere, stopped coming to the shelter. They'd never known what became of her. I told them what I could, and then they let me leave. There was a message on my machine at home that I didn't have to report to the school that night because of the heavy snowfall. It started as soon as I got back to my room, and it kept going on well into the night. I woke up a little past midnight, and it was still snowing. 
I got out of bed and stood in front of the window in my room, and I undid the blinds and I looked out. Even though it was dark, you could see everything because of the whiteness of the snow and the way it reflected all the light. I was on the third floor overlooking a little courtyard between the building and the one across from it. Outside in the snow I saw a man, all alone, sitting on a swing. There was a jungle gym in the middle of the courtyard for the neighborhood kids, and he was sitting there. And I saw that it was Father Hall. He was facing away from me, sitting and looking off at the building across the way. I watched him for a few minutes, and never once did he turn around. But I could tell it was him. After a while, I closed the blinds, and I wanted to get inside my closet. I wanted to get under the bed, disappear. But instead, I sat on my couch, and I waited, because I figured it was only a matter of time before he would come. About a half hour later, there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and Father Hall was there, a little bit of snow in his hair. He smiled at me and said it had taken him a while to figure out which building was mine. He came in, said he was out late walking around, and he wanted to know how my little therapy experiment was going. And I was able to give him some details. I was trying to sound normal, and I did all right. He then said he had an idea for me about what should come next. He had organized a gathering of people a little like me, four or five people who had been looking for some kind of guidance in their lives. And he wanted us to go together to a farm on the eastern shore, a farm which his father had owned, and which he had the use of. It was on a stretch of open land near Princess Anne, Maryland. From time to time he made a retreat out of it. He took people there for a few days of individual prayer and meditation. He and the others were leaving the next day, and he said I should join them. And I said, but no one's going anywhere, there's the snow. And he said there wasn't much on the roads, it wouldn't be a problem. I told him I had gone to the shelter that day, and they hadn't seemed to know who he was, and I watched his eyes when he answered me, but there wasn't much of a delay for thought. He said there were not just one or two shelters near there, but three of them within a five-block radius, and obviously I had gone to the wrong one. He wanted me to meet him in the parking lot of RFK Stadium the next night, at eight o'clock, and I could meet the others and he would drive us to the farm. It occurred to me very quickly that all I needed to do to get Father Hall to leave was to agree. If I agreed, he would go immediately. And he did. He got up out of his chair and he said he would let himself out, and he went out the door. I waited just a little while to make sure he wouldn't be anywhere outside, and then I put on my clothes and my shoes and my coat, and I went out. It came to me as I walked out why I didn't seem to really need alcohol anymore, why I had no craving for it suddenly. The alcohol had made me forget the zesominol, and the thing that had made me forget about alcohol, I realized, was fear. I walked down the road seeing just an occasional snowplow. No one was out. It was a little more than two miles to the high school, and when I got there, there was absolutely no one around. It seemed like the entire world was asleep. From walking around the school during my nights there as a guard, I knew a couple of ways I could get inside the building. One was by going around the back of the school on the wood side and climbing up the pipes back there. There was a whole network of pipes attached to the brick beside the Industrial Arts Department, it wasn't difficult to get up the pipes because there were a lot of horizontal ones. There was actually a window up there that was never locked because the lock had rusted so badly they'd finally just removed it. I climbed the pipes. They were slippery, but I managed. And I just went into the window up there, twelve feet off the ground. I threw my legs over the sill, and I fell a couple of feet into a storage room. It led out into the hallway, 
right around the corner from the two computer rooms. They were locked and I had no key, so I broke into one of them. I sat down in the dark, and I turned on one of the computers, and I was lucky because there was no code necessary to get onto the internet. I wasn't sure what to check, so I typed in words like false priests, impersonator, impersonating priests, variations of those, and no relevant stories came up. So I actually typed in Father Hall and called up all the results. There were so many. I started going through them one by one. I had been doing that for about 15 minutes when I thought I heard a door close far below me. I sat perfectly still, my fingers on the keyboard of the computer, for five minutes. I could see out into the hallway, but it was totally dark. I waited for something else to happen, but there was nothing. I followed every link to the phrase Father Hall that I could. The 20th or 30th one I clicked on took me to a website having to do with the history of Alberta, Canada, and there was a subsection of links having to do with various towns and cities in it. I clicked on a few, but I didn't see any reference to a Father Hall until I started reading about a place in northern Alberta called Fort Illard. It had been a logging camp for 30 years, from 1911 to 1941. It was in Fort Illard that a murderer named Horatio Vello was hanged in 1937. In 1937, there were more than 800 men living at the logging camp in Fort Illard, beside the Peace River. They were there ten months a year. The nearest other settlement was called Hulst. It was basically a sister camp to the south, where the wood felled in Fort Illard was processed and put on trucks and trains to be transported around the country. It was nine miles away down the river. Since both camps consisted entirely of men, of course there was a lot of drinking and fighting all year, and also a lot of gambling. The gambling was operated by two foremen in Holst, and bets were taken and money exchanged via the boats that went back and forth. These two foremen were very ruthless, basically working for an organized crime syndicate all the way in Detroit. There was one man who was an especially reckless gambler. He enraged the bookies and Holst too much for them to ignore, and then he finally refused to pay them anything. He claimed he had been cheated in some way. The word came from Detroit that the crime bosses who operated through the foreman literally wanted him dead. It would be almost impossible to kill him, though, because in such a small, isolated population, everyone would suspect the two or three men who usually did the enforcements on the bets. But for the gambling to continue, this man who refused to pay his debts would have to die. What made it even more difficult was that this man was the camp chaplain. He was a Catholic priest, a priest with a gambling addiction as well as a drinking problem. He'd been in Fort Illard for three years. His name was Anton Hall. Messages were exchanged back and forth between the two camps, between one of the enforcers in Fort Illard and one of the foremen in Hulst. His name was Sturridge. One night, Sturridge's connection to the other camp was sitting in his shack in Fort Illard with the only other two men who knew what was going on. A man knocked on the door, and when he came in he introduced himself as Horatio Vello. Villa was a worker who never seemed to say anything to anyone, who worked and slept and kept out of trouble and had no friends that anyone knew of. Vello said that if his gambling debts were forgiven, he would kill Father Hall. It turned out that Vello owed the people in Hulst a total of thirty dollars. Sturridge insisted that evidence of the crime be kept after the body was buried. This meant he wanted to see a a thumb, a a toe, something as proof that Father Hall hadn't just conveniently disappeared. Vello was supposed to send the evidence down the river on one of the small freight rafts that came into Hulst from Fort Illard every other day. Four days passed, and down the river came three small freight rafts, and Sturge and his partner went out to supervise the unloading. 
they spotted a red slash on a big crate, and they lifted it off and took it into a shack where no one could see. When they lifted the top of the crate, they saw the entire body of Father Hall. He had been put into the crate naked, in a sitting position. His head, his hands, and his feet had all been cut off, all set in his lap, and every one of his fingers had been individually cut off the hands. The men were revolted, and they buried the remains as quickly as they could. A few days after the murder, Vello, who had almost never said a word to anyone in three years, began to talk, and he talked a lot to anyone who would listen, about some very strange things. His main theme was human anatomy, which he began to study voraciously from the single textbook he managed to borrow from the camp's doctor. In particular, he believed that every trace of our authentic being had to reside somewhere inside the body, and could be found if it were dissected thoroughly enough. He believed the keys to identity had to be inside the body somewhere, that there must be something physical in the brain which made us hate or fear or love or create music. There must be some hidden valve or muscle in the heart which accounted for heroism. Within a week after the killing, the messages back and forth between the camps and all the conversation around Fort Illard about why Father Hall had disappeared made it obvious to Sturridge that Horatio Vello had to die next. There wasn't much time. Sturridge got on a boat to Fort Illard himself to arrive in the middle of the night and put an end to this man who was coming closer and closer to accidentally exposing everything. He just would not shut up. But Vello was gone by then. He had vanished. A few days went by, and a couple of men hiked into the woods and knocked on the doors of three small houses lived in by a trapper and his extended family. There was no answer in any of them. But through the windows of one of the houses, the men saw that something was very wrong. They broke into all of them, and in each they found the remains of the people who had lived there. Four men, three women, eight children, all of them cut up. Body parts were everywhere. The limbs were just lying about inside various rooms. They'd just been left there. The torsos were all gone, though. A quarter of a mile away in the woods they found Vello. He was working in the open air, dissecting each one of the torsos with nothing more than the knives from the houses and his bare hands. He was very calm when they found him. That was in 1937. The website I read didn't have much more. It did have a picture of Horatio Vello, though, taken from a newspaper actually only an hour before he was hung. And it had one of his victim, Father Hall. It was a very clear photo. They both were. The priest who had tried to become my friend of the past couple of weeks didn't look anything like Father Hall. In the photo, Father Hall, the gambling addict, had blonde hair and a mustache. Who the priest who came to my room looked exactly like exactly was Horatio Vello. There was no mistaking the resemblance. The hair was the same, the facial features were the same, especially the small eyes. In the newspaper photo they were looking off into the distance as he stood beside the gallows. I didn't hear any more sounds inside the school, and I left at about four in the morning. I walked through the snow, back to my room, always looking back over my shoulder. At five o'clock the next afternoon, I was on the metro train, standing with human beings for the first time in weeks. And after a 30-minute ride, I got off at the RFK stadium stop. I wanted to see the place where I had been told to go. It was a compulsion. In the 30 minutes it took to get there, I didn't even truly see the people around me, or hear their voices, or even sense the movement of the train. I was looking out through my eyes, but I was hiding, 
way behind them, far down in my brain. My body was just a shell to protect me. I got off the train at RFK and I was alone. I stepped out of the station and went up above ground and walked a ways. The parking lot was huge, just vast and empty. The cement was crumbling and there were a few inches of snow covering it. The sun was almost completely down, and no lights anywhere came on. I just walked through the parking lot for several minutes, watching the last of the sun go down, knowing that when it was perfect dark, I had to leave. I absolutely couldn't be there at eight. I walked along the very outer edges of the parking lot in a circle, getting warmer and warmer, and it got dark fast. I saw headlights creeping toward me. It was a cab that had swung off the main road and into the parking lot, taking a chance that I might be a viable fare. The window rolled down and this Asian man asked me if I needed a taxi, and I snapped back into sensibility. I got into the back and he drove away. He turned onto the main road and I told him I wanted to go to Union Station. I don't know why I said that. All I wanted was to see the lights of the city. I turned back at one point as we drove away and looked at the parking lot. I thought about Father Hall seeing my footsteps in the snow. Ten minutes into the ride, we were in the city. It was 6.30 and I began to feel very strange, very lightheaded. I felt hollowed out like I had lost 50 pounds out of nowhere. As I was looking through the cab window at the storefronts passing by, I saw that dark mass that I had seen in my room. It was there again, on the sidewalk. At first I thought I was looking at a black box. This time the mass was coming for me much faster, and I turned away. I looked out the other window, but it was everywhere in my vision. A fixed point, coming at me. I closed my eyes, but it was also there inside my eyes, getting bigger. And I cried out to the cab driver. All I said was, help me. And then I had no consciousness whatsoever. I was gone. The next thing I knew, I was in a rowboat. I was standing in it, balancing myself on the waves of the ocean. Above me, the sky was as threatening as any I had ever seen. It was so dark I thought it was night. I was about fifty feet off a beach, getting closer and closer to it. There was a man with his back to me on the beach. The boat bumped the shore just a few steps away from him, and I stepped out. I went up to the man, and I touched his shoulder. He turned to me. It was Maurice. He smiled when he saw me. He was glad I had come. We walked together along the beach. I asked Maurice what was happening to me. He said that, yes, Father Hall was who I thought he was. He was the murderer, Horatio Vello. He had befriended three living people since his death in 1937. He had attempted the first friendship five years after he was hung. The second came just a year ago when he had spoken many times to a homeless woman who lived in the same city I did. Why me, I said, and Maurice said that I must have become weak, suggestible to anything, especially my own death. In my weakness I had thinned the line between myself and Horatio Vello. He had been waiting on the other side, searching endlessly for a despairing person he could persuade into isolating himself totally, so much so that a total exchange was possible. If I were to meet him that night, Maurice said, Vela would come alone. There would be no others. What would happen then, no one knew. No one had ever known, nor seen what took place during one of these exchanges. For the weaker party, it would be quick and violent, unimaginably painful, and whatever I was would die. Vela would be on the earth again, not living, but present, aware, able to touch and feel, and that was all he wanted. I asked Maurice what I could do, where I could run. He said he didn't know. 
but I had to stay close to other people, maybe for a long time, so that Velo would no longer come near me. I had to never be alone, not for a moment. If I ever felt something trying to pull me out of the world again, I should scream, shriek, do everything I could to be seen and heard by other people. And I began to shout at Maurice in anger, shaking and crying, and I said, It's you who made me this way. This is because of what you did. And he said, Yes, I had a part in this. I helped you to become weak. I was part of the cause. I did it to you. And long ago, someone did it to me. When he said that, I saw an awful sadness in his face. We were standing in the water of the ocean, ankle-deep in it. I looked up at the sky, and when I looked back at Maurice, he was on his knees in the water. It was up to his chest, and he slumped forward with his eyes open. I tried to grab him, but he went face-first into the water and sunk, and within seconds he was totally under. He disappeared under the surface, and I didn't try to save him. There was another strange jump cut. I went from seeing Maurice sink into the water to being on a street in Washington, and for ten seconds I had no idea how I had gotten there. Then I remembered I had been in a cab and cried out for help, and the driver must have put me out of the cab, or maybe I jumped out, because I was on F Street, walking along the sidewalk, seeing people coming towards me. My body felt like it was full of water, all the way from my feet to my head. I walked toward the brightest lights I could see, I turned a corner and there was a bar there, and I went right in. The place was packed. It was an Irish bar. A band was playing. and People were everywhere. I just stayed in there for an hour or more, and I looked out the window at one point at the people passing by, and I realized that there was no snow on the street, no snow on the ground. I asked a man at the bar what the date was, and he said he thought it was the 15th, but it might have been the 14th. And that told me it had been almost eleven days since I'd gone to the parking lot at RFK Stadium. I'd lost eleven days of my life with no memory of how I'd spent it since I'd passed out in that cab. I was still wearing the same clothes as when I'd gone to the parking lot. From that point forward, for almost three years... I made every attempt imaginable never to be alone for any reason if it could possibly be helped. I left Washington the very next day. I had only $140 in my clothes. I took a crowded bus to Baltimore, where with incredible luck, I got a room in a group house downtown that very first day, me and seven other people. I paid for the room by getting the biggest cash advance I could against my credit card. I went out looking for a job the next day when the streets were busy, and a week later I had one, at a mall in the Inner Harbor. Going to and from work, I took public transportation to be surrounded by people. I arranged my schedule so I would arrive and leave work when there were guaranteed to be people on the street. I wouldn't even stand at the bus stop alone. On my days off, I went to bookstores and museums and movies and sat in restaurants for hours at a time. I made as many friends as I possibly could. If for some reason the house became empty, some freak chance where all my roommates were gone, I left immediately for a populated place. I never drank. Three years I lived that way. Finally, after I got an office job and began to look into graduate school once again, I moved out of the group house and into a townhouse with a friend at work. I felt I was ready to live normally again. I started looking around for a therapist, maybe one who would at least pretend to believe that everything that had happened to me was real. Last summer I found myself in that townhouse one night completely alone, a few weeks after my friend and I had moved in. He'd gone to Illinois to visit his mother. I'd be alone for almost a week. That first night I rented a lot of movies to keep my mind off things and finally I fell asleep in my bedroom at about two. At about four by the clock radio, I came awake. I didn't know why. I looked around my bedroom, keeping the light off, and didn't see anything. 
but I felt strange, and very soon I was terrified. I knew I had to speak. I had to say something. So I said what I had said three years before. I called out in my room very loudly for Satan to show himself. I waited and waited. There was such hate in me, I felt strong enough to face whatever might come for me. There was only silence. I got up out of bed. I went down the hallway into the living room. The living room was totally dark, just moonlight coming in through the big picture window. Someone was standing in the corner of the room, in front of it. But it wasn't a man. It was a thing more than seven feet tall, swathed in a black robe, a wrap of no material I could recognize, and it was staring out the window. It was just the same as when I had seen it years before in the boiler room of the high school, except now I was seeing its full height. Its hood was drawn back so I could see its misshapen head, its huge head with the featureless crimson eyes that didn't seem to be looking at anything. Its arms were hanging by its sides. The arms went almost all the way down to the floor. I stood there, looking at it, and very slowly it turned its head to look at me. There was that line of mouth. I could see it perfectly from all the way across the room. The moonlight struck it just right. Again, it did nothing, but this time, the eyes were taking me in. They weren't comatose any longer. I felt like I had nothing to fear from it then. Whatever it was, whatever it represented, it hadn't come to claim me. Very slowly, after a full minute, it turned its head back to the window. It wanted me just to see it. I was sure of it. I found the strength to turn my back to it and move back down the hallway. And I knew it was gone as soon as I walked away. I wouldn't go back to make sure. Now that this has all been set down, Whatever happens to me in the future, maybe at least someone reading this will say, he doesn't seem insane. That's all I want. I hope I've managed that. Now, at least, the tale is told.